a bunch of stuff that happens. It's also when too much reminiscing stalls the story. Here's an example. Joe saw Anne walking on the corner, and he immediately remembered the first time that they met. She was 18 then, just out of high school, walking her little poodle on the wrong side of town. She'd worn the same green cotton dress that she was going to wear when they were going to the Caribbean together. He never forget that trip. The weather was perfect for the first few days, but then the skies opened and it started to rain. Well, I'll just say they amused themselves well enough. Hey, Anne. He asked as she got in the car. How was your day? <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. You know. She shrugged, grinning. Gosh, that was so like her. It was also like her mom, too. Joe had remembered. <laughs> He'd known Anne before he ever met her mother in 1963, when he was only eight years old. Here, everything reminds the point of view character of something else. It's like trying to leave the house with somebody who keeps realizing they've left something inside, then something else, and then something else. With this constant application of the brakes, this plot has no chance of ever getting where it's going. Writing. I mean, you know, writing can be fun and all, but sometimes you don't know where to start and you don't know what to do. Maybe you just have a really bad case of writer's block, you know? Well, not to worry. Help is on the way in the form of Howard Middlemark and Sondra Newman's How to Write a Novel. Characterization. Joe had a really interesting personality, but a character described in generic terms made him sound like he was on a police report. Here's an example. Joe is a medium-sized man with brown hair and brown eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> Alan wore a white shirt and blue jeans on his tall frame. <laughs> Melinda had a nice body and a pretty stop. <laughs> <laughs> Descriptions like that make your characters feel like stick figures. Come on, no one ever thinks of himself as a brown-haired man of average height. <laughs> Police report descriptions in general will just be received by the reader as if it read. Horace was a man. With two legs, <laughs> two arms, and a head on top. <laughs> Another blunder that we have seen more than once is when plenty of authors reacting against a plethora of large breasted girls in fiction describe or just decide to describe the heroine as having medium sized breasts. <laughs> this ultimately amounts to saying, <laughs> she had breasts. <laughs> Compassion fatigue. This occurs when the character is way beyond help. An example. Ever since Melinda Spew given up college to look after her ailing mother, she struggled with depression. All her friends had just told her to let her mother take care of herself. After all, Mrs. Spew was an alcoholic who'd shown Melinda nothing but brutality and let a series of drunken stepfathers use the growing girl to sate their angers and lusts. But Melinda couldn't just cut the ties that bound her to her miserable past. And now that her mother had just died, Leaving her with crushing debt, Melinda was struggling just to even survive. She hoped that antidepressants prescribed by her psychiatrist would have made her capable of working, just like normal people. But instead, she gained 150 pounds and stop! <laughs> okay, characters should have serious problems. I get that. But one character should not have every single serious problem known to mankind. <laughs> Readers can easily identify with the protagonist who is a geek or a failure, but when all that character ever does is fail and wallow in self-pity, identification becomes a rather unwelcome burden. 
Amazingly, some of Bob's awesome sentences convey no information at all. <laughs> Except for uh, what we like to call said the fascinating man, where the author tells you what to think of his or her dialogue. <laughs> Here's an example. It broke in through the window, bringing with it a characteristic fishy odor, said the gifted storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> Soon, we were all pressed up against the walls, trying to stay out. He added terrifyingly. <laughs> <laughs> but what was it? We're here with Willie Van Grip? Asked the hilarious boy. <laughs> no, said the stranger with a mesmerizing facility with words. <laughs> it was not. <laughs> oh, was it a fish? The girl asked eloquently. No. No, fish this! The man said, stop! <laughs> Do not try to manipulate the reader into finding a character's dialogue, fascinating, amazing, funny, or whatever, by announcing that it has these qualities. <laughs> Honestly, if the dialogue isn't all that fascinating, claiming that it is will annoy the reader. Even when the quality is certain, really does exist, pointing it out just undermines the effect. Finally, preemptive strike. This is where the author already anticipates criticism. An example. And so we found ourselves trying all of the impediments to our love, overcome, alone together on our island home, swimming in the bliss, just as the dolphins swam in the bay. Joyful and serene. It was amazing how everything had turned out so perfectly. If I would read it in a book, I don't think I would have believed it myself. You were the light of my darkness, <laughs> Missy confessed with tears in her eyes. <laughs> I smiled, thinking that it would be incredibly hard to believe anyone would actually say something like that. It sounded like a really bad movie. <laughs> but it was so different when it happened in real stop <laughs> Here the weary and more than likely intoxicated author <laughs> who can no longer de deny the awfulness of whatever he's been writing attempts to deflect criticism by acknowledging the glaring flaws in his novel. He'll go on to have the characters just explain the problem away by pointing out that because it is real life, it's not subject to criticism, as it would be in a novel. Of course, whatever that was is a novel, <laughs> and nobody is fooled. As in many 12-step programs, acknowledging the problem is only the first step. Readers are not going to accept your unbelievable coincidences or cliche prose just because you acknowledge there's a problem. You must go on to fix the problem. It's not rocket science. <laughs> well, congratulations. If you have been following along, which I doubt it. You should now have progressed from being merely an unpublished author to being a novelist who is now completely invulnerable to publication. <laughs> Clad in the armor of incomprehensibility and offensiveness. <laughs> you can laugh at the threat of publication. You can now sleep at night, secure in the knowledge that not a single soul that you are not related to by blood, marriage, or fraternal bond will ever read your work, <laughs> let alone publish it. Because it sucks. <laughs> <laughs>